is you relating yourself, your identity, who you are, who are you, where are you coming from, where are you going, what these are some of the big questions when it comes to your identity, your destiny, and so on. So your relationship flows directly from understanding your unique identity. It gives you a sense of dignity, self-worth, and significance. So when we look at the life of Jesus, who is the model, Jesus is the model person, lived a righteous life. Uh, you see Jesus for 30 years. He was in Nazareth. He never uh, performed any written miracle. Maybe he did, but were not written. It seemed there could have been some things that, you know, maybe he did because Mary, when he, she talks to those people, said, whatever he tells you, do it. So that means she, she knew he would do something about it. And he must have performed a miracle quietly for her, something like that. We don't know what he did, and you cannot confidently tell what he did. But we know that Mary told them, whatever he tells you to do, do it. So she knew he would let her perform a miracle. So, But you see, Jesus had uh, those 30 years of quiet. He knew who he was. The Father constantly communicated to him who he is. It made him so secure that all through those 30 years, he never even had to tell anybody who he was. Later in John chapter 7, it says that even his brothers did not believe in him. So that means he did not perform a miracle to prove who he was. He did not do some special things to prove who he was. He was so secure in his identity that the first time the father spoke at the time of his baptism, saying, uh, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The father was so pleased with Jesus. Uh, by character, he had lived everything that the father wanted. So the father said, I'm well pleased with him. Uh, that, for us, as a human beings, those words of affirmation are very important, especially in the formative stages of our lives. When we are still young, we need to hear those words from our fathers, from our mothers. Words of affirmation communicate a lot to the children, especially the girls need to hear those words from their father. And the boy needs to hear them from their fathers as well, but especially for the girls, for their emotional stability, it is so, so important that they get words of affirmation. A child who has grown with that affirmation grows and becomes a very confident person. Confidence comes from those words of affirmation when we are still young. And, and when the more, the more and more you hear them, the more, the better for you. And then in life, when life treats you badly, when your spouse treats you badly, if you had those words and they, fall, they, they are within your foundation, then you are a very, very stable person emotionally. People who are emotionally unstable, normally it's because of lack, lack of those that affirmation. Now, when we come to the Lord, Jesus, and we get saved, um, that, that part we missed to receive, to hear the affirmation that we missed, we can get it from the Father. That is how it is so, becomes so important for people to spend enough time with God alone. Because whatever you missed from your parents, the words of affirmation and that kind of emotional support, you get it from God. God will do it and match up 
but your father did not give you what your mother did not give you. So that is the point of spending time alone with God. You, uh, I advise people that at least if you use Jesus' method of uh, a tenth of his time, if every month of 30 days you have at least a time when you can go for three days and just be alone. For people who are working, you get a free, uh, you apply, and they allow you to go for f- Friday. They give you a uh, um, time off or day off of Friday. Then you can leave on th- a Thursday evening. You leave office. You go somewhere where you can just be alone, no phones, no WhatsApp, nobody disturbing you, but you are alone with God. You are cultivating that relationship. You are cultivating that confidence. In uh, people have had that kind of background and foundation, find themselves very, very stable emotionally, psychologically, mentally, because that those words of affirmation are very important. So that is number two. Number three, we saw when man is rightly related with his God, who is the sovereign Lord, who is also the creator and the owner of the universe, then he connects to his unique identity. You connect to your uh, unique identity. The time of alone with God gives you ability for confrontation with the Lord, where he reveals himself to you, of who he is in you, and what you were yourself, because uh, what what uh, 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 time you, you get alone will bring out the gifts, and it is those gifts and talents of God that will make you a good steward. You connect your unique identity, you start to use your gifts, you discover your talents, and then once you discover your talents and you're in a right niche, then you become a very good steward on earth. So you can see number three flows from number one and two. So that's how you become a good shepherd, a strong man, a woman in the Lord, but also exercising dominion. Then uh, the last one is your neighbor. We saw that Adam's relationship with his wife, Eva, was changed at the time of the fall. You, woman, you have uh, connived with the serpent to rebel against God. From now, your desire shall come from your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, that is uh, something that came after the fall. That relationship between Adam and Eve was affected. And later on, that relationship with my neighbor is what gets corrupt. Corruption flows from that. And so Adam's relationship there is very important uh, with his wife and also represents all the other relationships. But when we return to the Lord, he starts to work within us to change ourselves, to transform ourselves. And and that is what God wants. We start to relate to God rightly. Then you start to relate with others rightly. These two relationships affect each other. Jesus said, if you are going to offer a sacrifice before God, that is vertical. And you remember you have ought against somebody somehow, put your offering there, go reconcile with that person, come back and continue to worship. So these are um, the, the issues where Jesus is emphasizing is the fact that the relationship with my neighbor affects my relationship with God and vice versa. The relationship with God affects the way you relate to other people. Okay. Then we we move to, we saw that that is the commandment 
Jesus said, this is the great uh, uh, commandment. There is no greater commandment than this. Uh, and all the law and the prophets hang on this, emphasizing the four H's, the head, the heart, the uh, hands, and the house. And we use those uh, pictures. I also explained this. Uh, for those who are not with us, we looked at the difference uh, between these, between the head has to do with comprehension, academic knowledge, education, understanding, which is the conscious mind. Then when he says, love the Lord with your soul, he's referring to your conviction, to your will, to uh, your vision, your mindset, your attitude. We refer to this normally by saying this is your subconscious, the part which is so important because it deals with the area of conviction. And now the heart, which is the conscient character, integrity, values, wisdom, uh, fear of the Lord, personal discipline, personal leadership, and this is the moral fabric. So we looked at the difference between those, that uh, knowledge is the accumulation of facts. We're dealing with the issue of, of why. Understanding is the appreciation of concept. And you're dealing with the session of why. While wisdom is uh, the application of knowledge and uh, that handles the area of how. So this wisdom here is a spiritual benefit. It comes from the fear of God and it means insight or discernment in all matters of life. It's not just academic. It is not what we normally refer to as somebody being clever, sharp, cunning, shrewd, crafty, or bright. It's just the ability, the, the knowledge, the people we call clever or bright. They are very good at remembering and they're very fast in their thinking. Otherwise, that has nothing to do with wisdom. There's a difference between wisdom the word wisdom there, and this, those other words. As Proverbs 3.23 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Okay. Now, um, we covered this. I will not go through this again because uh, I've covered the fall and how these four were affected. Now, I'm going to the next part, we know from scripture that the spirit of man comes from God and it handles the image. That is what God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness, let them rule. And we were created as spirits, but also God stooped down and made the physical body out of the ground out of the soil. So when he made that part, he was emphasizing the fact that we have another world in which we belong. We belong in the unseen world where he belongs. We are God's spirit. But then we are also physical. We are material. We rule material world. We are going to be responsible for the material world. So we need a physical body which is material. Uh -huh. That is the purpose of our body. It is so important that when the Bible is referring to the human being, it emphasizes the need for that, for the body, because Jesus himself had to put on a body. Every time he was challenged, which authority are you using? Where did you get it? He said, but I'm a a, a human being, um, meaning I'm a son of man, a son of Adam. I am a human being, and because I'm a human being, I have authority. Human beings were given authority on earth, and I'm not here as a spirit, but I'm here as a man, and so I have authority. So what he was emphasizing is what we already have. Now, your spirit 
and your soul and your body, each of them is important to God. Look at Mark 14. Here it says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. The spirit indeed is willing, but the body is weak. So I can want you to see in Mark that those three are mentioned, the soul, the spirit, and the body. So when the fall took place, uh, we know that the, the order uh, of that, as we see them here, the spirit is master, the soul is servant, the body is a slave. That was changed and it was affected because the inside, the spirit died, disconnected from God. So it could no longer take the leadership it was taking. Now man became flesh. Flesh in that sense refers to the soul and the body. The desires of the soul and the body, those are referred to as the flesh. And that is the realm of Satan. Satan, the world, and the flesh, we are told in, in a, uh, Anglican baptism, you fight the flesh, the world, and Satan himself. So you can see the importance of each one of these being properly fed is important. That's what Paul writes to the Thessalonians, that may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord. So the three parts must be kept intact. Now, what about the role of the truth in discipling the nation? We know from the scriptures that Satan rules this world through lies. First John 5.19 says that we know we are from God, but the rest of the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So Satan controls the world through lies. Another passage, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and he cast him into the bottomless pit so that he should receive the nations no more. So what is said here is going to be said in the future, but it reveals what he's saying now. What he's doing now is the accusation. He is accusing the brethren lying, lying and lying and lying because that's the way he controls the world. Jesus came, <clears throat> restored our nature by giving us opportunity to get his own life, the same life which he died with from the dead, which he rose from the dead. We know from the scripture in Ephesians 2.5, that it is that very life that he gave us. But more than that, he didn't just come to save us. He also came to restore our authority as God is regents on earth. That's why he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and disciple all nations. How? By teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, everything I have commanded you, teaching. So notice those words, you are going to teach the nation, you teach them what the Lord has taught you through planning, uh, through hearing, through experience, through the hard knocks in life and so on. So all authority he gave he got, he gave to us. He didn't go with it to heaven. He gave us that authority. God's kingdom advances through truth. It is written in First Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, that for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So God doesn't just want people to get saved alone. That is number one. But number two, he wants them to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is his intense desire, and he would prefer, prefer that all of us put that emphasis 
on our work to understand that God, the Father, is truth, the Son is truth, the Holy Spirit is truth. So they are coming down here on earth is to establish a kingdom of truth, which will be contrary to the worlds of the standards, <clears throat> to the standards of this world. Okay. God's intention is that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When everybody has come to know that, then we are okay. okay. God has written three books that truth of God can be found in those three books, the book of his words, the book of his conscience within us, the book uh, that is his reason within us, the book of nature and history. This is the book of God's works. Uh, uh, works are very important to God that be it is through work that we exercise dominion, through a, a power the work, uh, enlightened work, we can impact nations, uh, individuals, and so on. So <clears throat> God wants us to combine the three books. All our education in school and class, majority of it covered number three. Now, in our dichotomized world where we have secular and the sacred as a, a doctrine, which is actually a false doctrine. There is no such a thing as sacred and secular. The Lord has made everything. And so whatever we are involved in must be secular, uh, sorry, sacred, holy, set apart for God. It should be sacred. There is no any other alternative. We are either dealing with something sacred or secular. Now, when we go to work, many times when you're at place of work, we think this is not, this is not church. Uh, maybe God is not interested in what I do. That's not right. God is interested. When you study geology, you are studying what he did with the ground. When you study biology and you study human being, you are st st still learning what he did with the universe. This universe which he created has uh, stars, they're all over the place. So all those are his works. When you study them, when you combine uh, your knowledge, imagination and work, then you discover many others. Like the Harvard Shield, it had that, that was Harvard when it has first seas opened up. Harvard was a young man of, of uh, I can't remember his age was very young, but at age 36, he died. Uh, sat some, was he around late 30s when he died? And in 1636, he gave his library to start this college, and the, the college was to produce scientists uh, and, the, and, the, and theologians and the uh, doctors and what this this was later to become the university but at the beginning it was mainly this was this is what the founders used as a badge a school badge uh, you can see the words veritas in the middle very being uh, open because people are going to use their reasoning to find what is right that is philosophy or reasoning but also, there is another book, the, 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 the third book, they will still use their senses, or the second book, the book of nature. To explore that, you need the nature, uh, you need senses and observation. So those two books, the first two books, are facing up because you can discover those truths by reasoning, by philosophy or by a sense uh, uh, and, and a sense through senses the first the five senses uh, I should I should do here put senses I only put sense so God is works explored through senses uh, here I should add senses these are the five senses we know seeing 
hearing, touching, smelling, and tasting. Those are the senses that we use to study this book. It's used observation uh, to, to, to observe what is happening when you are doing an experiment that is part and part of, of discovering the, 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 the truth in that second book. The third book is facing down because you need revelation. This one here, it requires revelation. This is the book of God's word. The words, God's word requires revelation. And so it is facing down. I want you to also notice that these people, the beginning of all their education was about people understanding his church, Christ and his church. Christ on the left, you can see Christ here, and the Ecclesia is, is, is on the right. So it's truth concerning the Christ and his church. That is how they, were, they viewed this. So uh, this, this uh, gives us a very good foundation of what education should be. In education, children or people or students are uh, desirous to learn the three books, the four books, the three books God has written and uh, affecting the four relationships, the heart, the hands, the head, and the house. And we know from scripture that a person like David led with integrity of heart and skillfulness of hands. And the Psalms 24, one who has clean hands and pure heart and does not lift up his soul or head to do what to, to falsehood no so deceitful. So he's comparing and contrasting the godly man yeah, as it relates to these different edges, the hands, the, the heart, the head. Okay, um we've seen that. Now, I, I wanted to take some questions, comments uh, on this particular part. In your life, how, do you, how have you seen, especially these three relationships, how, how has it played in your life, the three relationships of... Uh, let me bring this up again. These three relationships, how <clears throat> have you noticed uh, how you, you have fared <clears throat> your relationship with God, affecting your relationship with your uh, yourself, affecting your relationship with the land or dominion mandate, and then affecting your relationship with each other. So I would like to hear from you now and, uh, and, and how we apply all this in the day-to-day -day life. We are looking at the application. Application, yeah. I'd like to hear some questions or comments on this. You can chat. Uh, but what we are dealing with here is the day-to-day -day application of this truth. For example, I said that the fall of man affected his image in us. We started to see ourselves as flesh and not spirit. That by itself alone was a very big thing. When man fell, at first, he saw himself as spirit, uh, but when he fell, he saw himself as flesh. Seeing himself as spirit made a big difference because God is the father of spirits. He saw God as his father. So he was secure in his father's protector and provider. But when he started, when he fell and started to see himself as flesh, he became he, he saw that he was naked. Now that his flesh, he's conscious of his nakedness. When his spirit 
he doesn't see the nakedness because angels or spirits are not conscious about that. Angels have a spiritual a cover, a spiritual body, have a spiritual body, but doesn't require the clothing that we do. But when he became flesh, he felt he was naked and had to look for clothing because he got disconnected from his father. He now became an orphan. His father, the God of spirits, is the sense of the source of his security. Now that he sees himself as flesh, and having been the first man, he had no father, so he became an orphan. That orphan spirit by itself is a big, 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 big issue. Very big for us as human beings, because all the problems that we encounter here on earth are a result of that. Man seeing himself as flesh, becoming insecure, becoming, uh, you know, thinking that I have to protect myself. He ran away from God. That is a sense of fear. He ran away. This is the source of many of the problems you have. The other thing is that he became limited in his creativity and innovation because now he has no flow. The flow from the spirit brings the innovative part of man. It is through that image that we are innovative. So this corrupted image here, the image of, of, of God, uh, is now not operating right. But originally is a moral being, and, and as a moral being, is pure, clean, innocent. When he falls, he's corrupt. He's a ruler, as God is a ruler, and his God is regent. When he, he falls, this was affected. He's a creator as God himself is a creator. And a man's creation comes through his work and imagination. So work and imagination combined, you produce science and technology. You are creative, you are innovative. So that these are the areas that were affected in man. Being created in God's image elevates man above other creatures gives us a sense of dignity, special sense of dignity. We are created in the image of God. When the revelation of that comes, we feel good about ourselves. We feel that we are significant. We have something to contribute to our life here and for the kingdom. So those that, that, that these two relationships, God and the one of, of, of self, seeing himself as flesh and meaning that he's an orphan and being naked, becoming insecure, being full of fear, full of guilt, full of shame, the victim mentality or mindset. These are all the effects that we have and why many cannot rise to become what God has intended them to become because of those uh, feelings of guilt, shame, fear, insecurity, victim mentality, other than the uh, resourceful mentality where you are victorious, where you feel loved, accepted, affirmed, and so on. So let's, let's look at that in the day to the life, in your life maybe, or in the life of other people you're working with in your office. Yes, uh, praise the Lord, Bishop, and uh, thank you very much for uh, this wonderful word. Uh, I would like to share about um, our relationship with God and how it, it has impacted on my understanding and how I, I, I do my work. And um, for me, the greatest, maybe not, I wouldn't say the greatest, but I discovered that uh, in the past I used to think that I pray to God to give me something, but when I discovered that uh, in 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 Exodus chapter nineteen verse four where it says you have seen what I've what I've done to the Egyptians, 
how I bore you and God's wings to bring you to myself. Um, for me, that helped me to understand that it is not actually me seeking God. It's not God is not there to to just supply things or to protect me, but He wants me to have a relationship with Him. But also, He wants me to be a priest and also a king. Now, a priest ministers to God, but a king rules on the earth. So when I discovered that, I began to take my work as ministry to God. And some of the things that I have I have seen is um, that God is interested in my work. And so I began to pray for my organization, for the people I work with, for the decisions uh, that we make. But also, uh, I, I discovered that God is so interested in my work that even when I have a problem, uh, for example, one of the things uh, I've I really discovered was that God actually knows uh, Excel, God knows technology, God knows all these things. And um, while I'm here in Mozambique, I have been able to, by God's grace, to, to uh, I don't know how I can describe it, but you find it, there's a very big problem which no one has found a solution, but God gives you wisdom and you're able to interpret the law convert it into formulas and develop a tool which reduces work, let's say, for, for a whole month or a whole year into just a few clicks, uh, copy and paste, and it automatically uh, produces things. And so um, when you started teaching about this, I, I looked at my organization when I came here it was doing more of humanitarian work rather than development because Mozambique is one of the most vulnerable countries to to flooding, to cyclones, to natural disasters. And, um, and so when I looked at the work that we do right now, the disasters have completely reduced and uh, the development funding has grown. And for me, that is significant change in the work we do because now instead of addressing cyclones, flooding, and the and the war, we are now addressing things to do like with uh, education, disaster preparedness, uh, resilience, uh, food and nutrition, uh, health, which are now more into developing um, uh, the the people, but also uh, growing. Uh, the education sector here in Mozambique. And so when I look at, um, when I connect uh, the, the way God wants me to influence the organization and the way we work, right now we are no longer focusing on disaster, but more on development. Now the other one is to do with the, with the people. Previously, I used to, worry about maybe I'll lose my job, maybe what, but now I discover that no, I'm here to disciple people. The faster I develop them, the faster they, they grow, the better. And, um, and the team here has grown, but looking back to the team I had in Uganda, all the people I left, some of them were officers, some were coordinators, others were managers, and I took time to pray with them, to, to encourage them, to teach them the word, but at the same time, to help them uh, relate their work to, to, to what God wants them uh, to be. And I remember one of the ladies uh, on my floor uh, called me, Lawrence, I feel like asking for salary raise, but I know what you're going to say. And she quoted, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 to 24, which says, Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, for you will receive a reward as an inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I, I had not known that, but because she quoted it, it's like the word had actually touched her. And now when I look back, all those people uh, are now working with uh, either 
our UK office, others have moved on to Afghanistan, to Nigeria, to to Jordan as um, as either directors or managers. And uh, uh, about a month ago, one of the people, one of the coordinators, finance coordinators we had, uh, went to work with our Hong Kong office, and then from there she was uh, appointed. She was um, head hunted, and she's right now uh, an operations director. And I, when I look back, these are people I started hiring. Some of them as interns, and 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 I discovered that although they came as interns, I would make sure I sit on the interview. And I will tell them, if you're coming here, I don't want you to just remain an internal an officer, but to grow, to be either like me or even better than me. And when I did that, you can now clearly see that all of them have, have actually grown. And now here in Mozambique, I came and almost half of the team, they were telling me to fire them. But I said, no, let me give them a chance and develop them now. In three years, three to four years, the people have changed, they have grown, they have become so good that now actually even the our headquarter office in London, they are now actually asking me to give them uh, some of my staff and others have been uh, actually uh, going to work with our uh, London office. So I, uh, when, when we discover this, you, you're able to, to, to treat others like a number four, the, the people around you. You're able to develop them, to disciple them, to be what uh, God wants them to be. And, and for me, the fear to, to, to lose a job, I, I think for me that was a great liberation because it helped me understand that actually the more people I develop, the more room I create above for me to be able to grow. And uh, finally, um, I, uh, I want to, to really thank God. There is some work that I was doing and, uh, and somehow the whole organization had decided not to pursue it. It's into climate change. You have seen how nations are flooding like Spain, like in Nigeria recently, then Dubai was flooding. So there's a lot of um, work going into that, and it's kind of like a new area. And people were, in our organization, people didn't know how to handle it, but somehow God gave me uh, a button to pray about it, and he started guiding me on how to uh, address it and how to plan and how to write proposals. And they had even hired a company, a consultant, to do the proposal for about four hundred thousand dollars, and the consultant failed. So I worked with the, another uh, technical advisor. We did this work, and we were able to 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 have a winning proposal. And now, the London office, the US office, and the UK offices, they are now actually consulting me on how to design and set up and all that. But most of these things sometimes. God wakes you up in the night and tells you now, this is how you're going to, to do this thing. And then as you're there, he gives you maybe an international accounting standard, which has an idea which you can now apply. And then in the end, you find that when you put all the pieces together, you're able to address the different needs of the different stakeholders, but in a much, much simplified way that Everyone, when they look at it, they begin to wonder, how did you uh, come up with this uh, kind of solution? So sometimes even the committees where you're not, and they are put maybe on Niva Zoom, and what, in the end, they you find that they say, no, no, let us call. So I'm so to come and be part of the meeting. And then now you begin to influence and direct and, uh, and advise, and then you find that your advice becomes... Uh, like let's say a global standard or the way of doing things going forward. So I really want to thank you, Bishop. Uh, ever since uh, you started sharing about the Dominion mandate for me, it has really impacted. Thank you so much.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. That is great. Thank you, thank you so, so much, uh, Lawrence. I would like some people to comment on that part that uh, we, which you say that the moment you understood that God took you to yourself, meaning you understand, you're bringing directly that connection. I, I took you from Egypt for my own self. Now, that connecting with the relationship, your relationship with God, your identity in God released you from fear, meant you could now develop other people without fearing for your job, your position, so do you see that 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 um, that comment that uh, part where you you're connecting with God's purpose for your life immediately affected your relationship with others instead of looking at them as the threats to your work to your job to your position now that you're connected to God you've connected your identity in God, you became secure, you knew why you were there, you started to develop other people. Now they are all missionaries. That's how God looks at it. There's no secular and sacred, remember? It's all sacred. They are now your missionaries, the missionaries of the kingdom, of the kingdom of God. You, you, are, you expanded the kingdom by you teaching and training those people and giving them the skills that they needed. That, that's the part I want, especially people in the marketplace uh, to comment on and, and see the importance of that. That you, you, you are an accountant who produces many accountants because God tells you to be fruitful, to reproduce, to multiply. Now you are multiplying your talents, you are multiplying your gifts, that's what God says, be fruitful and multiply. So I would like to, 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 to have some, you know, talk about that.